Is there more to midlife than just getting through it? Absolutely. Welcome. I'm your host, Debbie Cunningham, jazz artist turned midlife mentor. And I'm here to say to you loud and clear, it's time for your midlife crescendo. Well, hey, friends. I can't believe this is the last Monday in March. Here in Middle Tennessee, winter is finally over and we are on to spring for however long that lasts before Tennessee summer appears. Spring and fall are my favorite seasons, so I am thoroughly enjoying every minute. Speaking of seasons, if you are in the season of transition called perimenopause or menopause itself, or actually post-menopause, this next information is for you. A few weeks back on episode 7, I interviewed Dr. Anna Kabeka about balancing your hormones naturally. If you enjoyed her information and want to hear more, she has a free masterclass coming up April 1st, 2024, that you'll want to register for. Mastering Your Hormone Health Before, During, and After Menopause. So basically, this info is for all of us midlife women. Okay, so this might be TMI, but I'm 58 and eight years past menopause. But Dr. Anna's approach has helped me post-menopause to have much better health overall. Unfortunately, the decline of estrogen in menopause wreaks havoc on our physical bodies. The decline affects our mind, our joints, our heart health, and more. And as you may have heard me say before, knowledge is power, friends, to make the wisest choice for yourself and your body. She will also have a QA and a time at the end, so you'll get a chance to ask her questions. So that being said, you can find the link to her free masterclass on mastering your hormone health in today's show notes, but also I'll be posting it on my website, debbiecunningham.net forward slash girlfriend. That's debbiecunningham.net forward slash girlfriend. Okay, so about today's interview. Today's topic is helping our parents or other loved ones age with grace. My guest today is Shannon Scott, and she's going to share her journey of walking with her mom through dementia. I'm telling you that before we start the interview, just in case, based on your own story, this may trigger some emotions for any of you. I hope you will listen, however, because I think you will see it is a beautiful story of God's grace through it all. So here's my conversation with Shannon. Well, hey, everybody. Today on the podcast, I have here with me Shannon Scott. She has been in ministry for over 28 years in a variety of roles, believing that the local church and the community found there is essential to a life of flourishing. Shannon loves the privilege of teaching the Bible and serving among her church family. She travels to speak at churches, conferences, and retreats, and enjoys seeing the larger expression of the church in all its forms and flavors. Recently, Shannon completed her leadership development certification and launched Divergent Collectives as a leadership coaching and event production firm. She enjoys coaching others in both one-on-one and team settings, as well as getting to produce several events a year specifically designed for maximum impact for those that attend. She has been married 24 years, the mom of three, and is looking toward empty nest and leaning into whatever adventures God has in store. Welcome, Shannon. We're so glad to have you today. Thank you, Debbie. It is a privilege to be here, truly. Thank you. The first question I always ask my guests is tell us something about yourself that is not on your bio. Oh, goodness. There's a lot that's not in that bio, but I, you know, on the fun side, I would say I am an avid college football and major league baseball fan (laughs) only as it relates to my two pet teams. So I'm a Florida Gator on the college football side, but on the baseball side, I am an Atlanta Braves fan born and raised and will (laughs) die an Atlanta Braves fan. So I am in for heartbreak often as we get into the postseason, but it does not change my love for them. So that's the part I don't talk about as often in a Bible teaching context, (laughs) but it is very true about me nonetheless. (laughs) And you are a diehard fan. I know that to be true. (laughs) Yes, yes. diehard. So 
Well, Shannon is an amazing Bible study teacher and speaker, and I've had the privilege of sitting underneath her teaching for the last year and a half. She is amazing at excavating the scriptures and squeezing out every last morsel she can. And it has been such a blessing uh, to me and all the women who show up regularly, over a thousand of us to show (laughs) up to see her. But today's conversation is all about helping our parents and loved ones age with grace. And so I've invited her here to talk a little bit about her journey, caring for her mom through dementia. So would Mm -hmm. you like to tell us where that journey began? Yes. So um, both of my parents have been in full-time ministry my whole life. So my dad was a pastor my whole life on staff at a church and he developed Parkinson's disease, actually early onset Parkinson's disease back in 2005. And that journey lasted until 2018 when he went to see Jesus. And so shortly uh, after that, uh, you know, through checking on my mom as she'd lost her husband and everything, we had already moved to Nashville and she was still in Atlanta. And about six months into that process, she just said, I am done with living by myself. And I said, well, you're welcome to live with us, but you're going to have to move to Nashville to do it. (laughs) So we moved her to Nashville and through the kindness of the Lord, we had a a basement apartment in our home. And so she was able to move into that. And she began attending our church, Debbie, and was there's a really sweet senior adult ministry there. And she was able to continue playing piano, which she played for my whole life in every church we were ever in. The senior adult ministry needed a piano player. She was able to do that and really settled into life here. Here with us starting in 2019, I would say. And then last October, so more than a year ago, October, we were about to celebrate my daughter's birthday and she had bought all the presents she wanted to give her and all those sorts of things. And I said to her, mom, we are going to celebrate on X night. And so we'd love to have you come up and we'll all have dinner together. And she said, well, I wish that you had told me that it was Allie's birthday. And I said, well, you know that because there's all the presents. And she said, I didn't get those. And I said, Mm. yes, ma'am, you did. And you wrapped them all. And this is your card. And that was very concerning to us because that is the antithesis of anything she has ever um, expressed or been like. And (laughs) So over the next week, more things like that were happening, things she should know, things she should understand. And so I frankly was really concerned that she'd had a stroke. And Mm -hmm. uh, so my husband and I made an appointment with her primary care physician. They immediately sent us to a neurologist specialist and, you know, they were asking her all the questions that neurologist asks, uh, what day is it? What year is it? Who's the president? All those sorts of things. And those were difficult for her to answer. And that really shocked me. And so after MRIs and all the things, they just said she has not had a stroke. Um, But based on everything that her brain is showing us, it is age related decline, um, which is more commonly just like sudden onset dementia, really. Um, And so that was in October. And from October to the end of January, we cared for her in our home. And it, it was, you know, so difficult. And one of the things I love to be able to tell people who reach out to me because they know of mom's struggle and are starting to encounter it themselves is you're never actually prepared for the switch from being the child to needing to parent your parent. So no matter how old you are, you just, they're always your parent. And so to then having to say things like, no, mom, you may not drive anymore. No, mom, you may not have your credit and debit cards anymore. No, mom, you may not have a cell phone because somebody's going to call you and ask you for your social security number and you're going to think it's real and it's going to be a scam. And so all of those things transpired in that October to January time frame. Well, that's a short amount of time. Yeah, yeah, very short. Um, And that 
that is also what was so difficult about it. You know, with my dad, his Parkinson's disease was a really long and slow goodbye. It was really only really bad with him for the last year of his life. Um, with her, one day everything was fine. And then all of a sudden our lives were completely different. But it began to be unsafe for her to be in our home anymore. You know, my husband's a full-time touring musician, so he's gone a lot. My kids are all teenagers and dr drive themselves and were able to be helpful in that sense. But they also had full-time jobs and were in athletics and shows at school. And so they weren't here. And now I'm working full-time at the church. And how do we juggle right. all of this? And in those times, she was falling and hurting herself. She was fall and then not be able to get herself back up. And so if we weren't home and she wasn't near a phone, I would come home and she would have fallen untold hours before and just laid on the floor. And so those things were gut wrenching and traumatic. And as we started to get counsel, people who are specialists in um, dementia and Alzheimer's care, which I am decidedly not, were beginning to say, it's going to really be important that she be somewhere where she is safe and where she is cared for, where she is being given and administered medication rather than needing to try to remember to take it or you handling all of that. Cause I had become right. suddenly a pharmacist and a right. chauffeur and a chef. And I was suddenly all these things for the woman who'd always been those things for me. And so it was, um, it was traumatic, but in January of last year, we were able to put her into an assisted living facility here in Tennessee, and they were so kind and took such sweet care of her and were able to give me updates on what they were seeing because they were experts in it and able to give me updates relative to the other people in the facility and my my kind of standards for the facility were like, it can't feel like a nursing home. It can't smell weird. It can't be <laughs> restrictive right. in the sense that she's now in a hospital bed of some kind because she was fully able-bodied. It was just her mind was failing her. Um, and they assured me it wouldn't be that way. And it wasn't. But then one day she left the assisted living facility without anyone realizing it because at that level of care, there, it's not restrictive on There's when they- a lot of freedom. Go. Yeah. Um, Cause some people that live there even still drive or go places. Um, right. And she got out, she crossed multiple lanes of traffic in our town here and ended up at an oil change facility across the street from uh. her, her assisted living facility. And we were out of town when this happened. And okay. so they called me and said, it's going to be difficult for you to hear this, but it's time for us to move her into a memory care facility where we take care of her 24 hours a day. She, and, and she's not able to get out. And that was really emotional. And mm -hmm. for any of your listeners who are caring for their parents or making decisions about when is the best time to kind of call in the cavalry and the professionals, the guilt of that is real. The The guilt of not being able to suddenly be a full-time care provider is real. Some people are able to do that. We we lack the expertise in, in how quickly the dementia was progressing to be able to care well for her um, in our home. And so we moved her into a memory care facility. But Debbie, I just have to tell you how the Lord has gone before us because I told you she's completely able-bodied. She's certainly the youngest person there. She'll turn 80 on Monday. She's the youngest person in the facility. She's the most mobile. She she has the most of her faculties most often in the facility. And so they the the sweet nurses and administrators there had already thought ahead about what do we need to tell her to make this move the least traumatic for her. And how does the narrative need to be so that she kind of won't realize what is happening? Right. Because as I found out, it was they they were telling me, you know, 
she she will say things that you'll be like, that's not true. But there's absolutely no fruit in trying to convince her otherwise because right. she's not operating in the same reality I am. So they were like, <laughs> you're going to need to get accustomed to white lies and small things that keep her reality something that is not traumatic for her. So they told her they needed her help. They had started um, having her help with office tasks at the facility because she was a church staff member for 40 something years and phenomenally organized and administrative. And she typed faster than anybody I know. And so they would start to say, hey, we need all these things collated to send to all the residents in the facility. And mom would stand there and she'd whip it all out. So they made her a name badge. That's amazing. Facility, a staff name badge. <laughs> and it just said her name. And then it said special helper. And they put it on a lanyard and they asked her to move from the apartment she'd been in to this apartment over here down the hall a bit so that she was closer by to help them. And so her move was so stress-free and now she's safe and getting her medications on time. We can come anytime we want. We can bring the dogs, we can visit. And she's gotten far enough away from the move that now she's not asking to leave anymore. And is right. she's slipping further into you know, just not knowing the right details or the right things or even where we are. I don't know that she could even tell you that we're in Tennessee, Um, but she's happy and she's safe and she's not uh, falling and being traumatized like that anymore because she has the right kind of care. So it remains hard to have effectually lost both my parents, you know, in my mid forties, but I'm grateful that while I have her here and while God sees fit to lengthen her days that she's safe and she's cared for and she's only about five minutes away. So yeah, so that's our story. (laughs) I love that story. Well, you answered a lot of the questions I was going to ask. You're good. (laughs) But one of the things I wanted to ask you is one of the hardest things about caregiving Mm -hmm. is that it's exhaustive. So when you were in that season where you were doing all the things, How did you find balance? Were there things that you did to maintain personal balance there? Um, Yes, we tried to share the load as much as possible. Um, I had, I'm, I'm somebody that doesn't wake up in the night. Like I don't get up to go to the bathroom. Like when I go to sleep, I'm asleep until I wake up in the morning. But multiple times through this process, I feel like the Lord would just wake me up at 3 a.m. And I would go out into the living room and mom would be, sitting upstairs, she'd be completely dressed, ready to go, full face of makeup, purse in her hand, just like, okay, it's time for us to go to a place she worked 50 years ago. Um, And so I got to where I wasn't sleeping because I was worried that she was up and about or gonna, you know, one time we found her outside with a big mag flashlight looking at something um, on the street. And those, that's what I mean by it started to become unsafe. And so We pretty much with my two sweet teenage kids that still live at home, we just all banded together and it was like, someone's going to always be here and we're going to arrange our schedules accordingly and we're going to give each other spells where people can rest and not have to be so vigilant all the time. And I will say that, that is definitely a kindness of the Lord that number one, my kids were old enough to be able to be helpful versus be more people I was taking care of. Um, and so to people who do not have that built in or live in circle of people to help, I highly recommend a tribe of people who are invested in your story and your journey and can, help hold your arms up because the exhaustion is real. And when we get exhausted, we tend to not be able to make (laughs) wise, rational decisions because everything seems emergent and urgent and like, um, life or death. Overwhelming. Yeah. Yes. Overwhelming. Um, but then you add the guilt of, right. Am I giving up if I engage professional care? And I just, I think the answer is no, with, with the exception of a few of us, God has not equipped every one of us to be a 24-hour caregiver. I don't, 
Uh, a lot of people say, you know, honor your father and mother. That's what scripture says. And one of the ways I could most honor her was to ensure she had the best care around her um, when it wasn't able to be me. So now she gets the best of me again instead of my tapped out, exhausted at the end of my rope and her not making sense and me trying to tell her she's right or wrong. That just was not good for our relationship. And so I'm grateful that that aspect is no longer (laughs) up in the mix (laughs) as high as it was. (laughs) Well, it's good though, that you can have, now she's in a safe place and that you, your times with her then are not combative. Because a lot of times when we're caregivers, the the person who's being cared for almost resents the caregiver sometimes Mm -hmm. or resents them telling them what to do, especially in a parent child relationship that often happens. So it's good that she's been able to move somewhere safe. And now is she still playing the piano? So she is. So that was (laughs) another way that God just went before us. We, when we got to the, to the original facility, um, they have a baby grand, a gorgeous baby grand piano <laughs> wow. in the lobby. And she walked in the first day that we were there. I don't even know that she cognitively was aware that we were moving her in, but she walked in, saw that piano, walked right over to it, sat down and played a beautiful rendition of Amazing Grace by ear and by heart. And that. the administrator and the nurse who were with us started tearing up. And I said, oh, gosh, was I'm so sorry. And they said, no, we don't have anyone here who can play. So the piano had been donated to the facility, but no one there plays piano. Oh, wow. So she has become, they put her on the schedule regularly to play piano for the residents. And she plays on Sunday morning. And that is one of the areas of her mind that has not slipped at all. That's amazing. The musical, the musical gift, the reading, the music, all of it is still there. So we actually, we actually went over a couple of weeks ago because we started having that feeling of like, at some point, this is probably going to slip. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went over and professionally recorded her playing 30 minutes of hymns. Um, so that we would just have it. Um, That's beautiful, Shannon. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And so what it's a gift. Like Yes. What a gift, Wonderful. really. Wonderful. And, and yeah. the tenderness of God. Yes. To have that for her. I just love that, really, that part of your story. Well, tell me, were there things that you felt like, there were hard things you were sharing about having your mom in the house. Were there unexpected joys when that season came? I know that's sometimes in the midst of that hardship, it's hard to see initially, but Mm -hmm. in hindsight, do you see unexpected blessing or joys in all of that as you cared for her? You know, I do because one of the things I struggled with when my dad was declining was it was my first year on staff at the church. And so I moved away from my parents and away from Atlanta to take this job. And my dad began a sharp decline and I couldn't be there day in and day out. And so part of what I struggled with when he died was that I just felt like I should have been there more. Um, And it was kind of the Lord to give me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like there is no question that I was there you know, for every minute of what my mom needed in those se- that season while she lived with us. But it also, Debbie, you know, if I had to categorize my relationship with both my parents, if there was any combativeness, combative would be a very strong word. We, did, we do not have a combative relationship, but we're enough alike that we could butt heads more than me and my dad would have. But in the season where she was um, where, where her mind has been slipping. Some people experience a really combative person that they're caring for Mm. when that happens. And in the attempt to regain control or to try to understand why they can't remember, sometimes they go to anger. My mom didn't, she went to more funny and (laughs) just like, I have no idea what I'm saying right now. And I'm aware that I don't know what I'm saying. Have you ever (laughs) talked to somebody who has no idea what they're saying? And, And so that we giggled and laughed, you know, in the times where she wasn't, it wasn't that she was unsafe. It was just that she was talking out of her head completely. And yeah. then she <laughs> it. 
So there were, there were sweet things where I was able to actually care for her meet needs because Mm -hmm. she's so effectively and beautifully met needs for me. So it, it has felt like a sweet opportunity to live out my gratitude for her parenting of me by being able to care for her. And, and even still, even now, you know, much of our financial resources go toward helping with that. And that's a joy and a privilege. And I think that's the living out of honor your father and mother. So it's a way I can honor her and telling her story, honestly, that you would let me come and talk about her who none of your listeners know, but I hope we'll be able to glean some encouragement from and some opportunity to remember, you know, I'm very aware that this is not forever. One day I won't be able to go down the road and visit her. And so I want to be really present and cherish that rather than being annoyed or being frustrated or wishing it could be a different way. Well, I was going to ask you if there were things that you felt like God was prompting you to lean into during this season. And Mm -hmm. it sounds like that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. The presence. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I'm really aware that I'm modeling for my children how um, to care for parents. And so me... Which is good because they'll be caring for you. (laughs) Those tables are going to turn. Yes. Um, Should the Lord tarry and something uh, something else not happen, my kids will be in the same boat. And so I you know, when I'm tempted to be frustrated, I feel like God's been very kind to remind me you're modeling for your kids. And it's interesting because my mom modeled it for me. Her mother had Alzheimer's. And so she cared for her while she could. And then when she couldn't, she was in a nursing home. So the other thing that I think God has prompted me toward is to dig, dig a little into, um, mental, capacity in my family. It seems to be something that is hereditary for my mom's mom had it. Now she has it. And my mom was diagnosed about 10 years earlier than her mom was diagnosed. Um, Mm -hmm. So I've even started paying attention to my own physical health and my own, you know, mental acuity and how do I stay sharp and how do I not take God's gift of mental clarity for granted And are there ways that I should be caring for the temple he's given me, you know, with the end in mind and the fact that his plan is his plan and he's sovereign. But if there were things I was doing or things I was consuming that were contributing that, you know, scientists know contribute to dementia, maybe I don't want to do that because I might be predisposed to it. (laughs) So in the same way that we learn from those sorts of things, I feel like it's been a wake up call for me to pay attention to how I'm caring for the one and only temple that I've been given. Yeah. So yeah, it's hard. I will say caring for aging parents is an honor and a privilege and it's beautiful and it's brutal and it's difficult and it's often unexpected and it requires grace. Only God can give. It is not something I can muster up in and of myself. Um, And so I have great compassion and great empathy for anyone walking that same journey. Um, And I'm not doing it perfectly, but I do see the grace of God in it. And he's been very good to us and very good to my mom in it. I'm so grateful. Tell me how, how have this impacted just out of curiosity, your children, how have you seen this impact their walk with God or even just is being a part of the family? Have you noticed anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, My oldest does not live with us and, and didn't during, well, that's not true. She, she had her senior year, the first year that my mom lived with us, but now she lives in Orlando. And when we tell her what's happening, she gets very emotional because she hasn't seen it playing out. You know, she just remembers grandma was fine. Now, what are you telling me? Wait, you're putting her in a facility. So she's been very emotional and I have had her wanting to come home and visit. And when she's here, she wants to go visit, which I'm grateful for. For my other two who are still at home, 
you know, it matures you quickly when you go through something like this. Um, it's no longer someone else's story or a thing that happened to someone else. It's something that's happening in real time. So what I've been grateful for is to see my kids be aware that it is a really heavy load on me and their dad and of their own volition, step up and say, how can I help? Is there anything I need to do for you? Is there anything that grandma needs? Um, and then when we would have to go away and they would be home, they were just beautiful caretakers for her. And so watching them interact, I kind of think I got a glimpse into what they'll be like as full-blown adults, you know? Yeah. But, you know, my youngest is still in high school and my son was for most of that time. And it has um, definitely worked a maturity in them that probably wouldn't have gotten there another way because they now have firsthand experience with something that is really hard to explain to other people unless you've walked through it. Right. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, if there are women listening, you've already, uh, you know, averted to that, but what tips or advice would you give them if they're in the throes of that right now about mm -hmm. caring for someone? Yeah. A couple of things. First, I would say they're your parent because God gave them to you on purpose. So there's a reason they're not someone else's parent who's having to figure this out. There's a reason that they're your parent. And so Yes, read things. Yes, get wisdom and insight, but also trust the gut that God's given you on what is best for your parent at, in what season and at what point. That was the advice that was given to me when I was really struggling with the decision of, is it too early to be getting help? Trust your gut. There's a reason that God gave them to you um, would be the first thing. But secondly, no one should walk this alone. No one should do this in isolation. It's a very isolating disease for not only the person that has it, but the caregivers. And God didn't you know, intend for us to be in isolation. He intended for us to be in community. That's where flourishing and thriving happen is in community. And the, and the gross thing about dementia, Alzheimer's, any mental issues is that it immediately begins to isolate the person because as soon as you don't operate in the same reality as everyone else, you disconnect, you start to disconnect. But that can also happen to caregivers because no one understands the load that you're carrying and still trying to do your normal life as you do it. And so it's really important to listen to podcasts like this, to find real people that you know that have walked through this and can help and to not be afraid to say, I need help. And to, I, I do, I really want to dispel the shame around letting people who have trained for this and are made for this help intervene when our parents begin experiencing it because I did, I don't have any medical training. I'm right. not a neurologist. I'm not a sociologist. All I know is how to raise children and, you know, take care of myself. So I was able to rely on just common sense and skills and reading for a long time, but then it became to where we just needed intervention and help. And that is really when the load decreased a little bit from being so oppressive and heavy and exhausting to, okay, this is our new reality now. This is a, a new thing that we have to learn how to operate in. But thank goodness I don't carry the fear that I had that right. something's going to happen. If something happens, it'll happen in the context of the safe environment that she's in. And I trust the Lord with that. So yeah, that's good. Well, what is new for you in this next season? Oh, goodness. Well, I am starting a podcast. I'm so, so excited. <laughs> it will be called Everything Made Beautiful. And um, I taught a series called Everything Made Beautiful, all about seasons out of Ecclesiastes chapter three. And that we see in Ecclesiastes, you know, there is a time for, time for everything and a purpose for everything under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to laugh, a time to weep, and all these seemingly contradictory things. But then we get down to verses 10 and 11, 
And it says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And so what does it look like to consider all the seasons of our lives and how God might be wanting to make them beautiful? So that's what the podcast will center on. That will start sometime this spring. And so I'm excited about that. You mentioned in the bio, I do a lot of leadership coaching Mm -hmm. um, with teams and leaders. I love that. It's what I've you know, been doing for the last 30 years or so on a church staff. So to get to kind of spread my wings and do that with other people, I love. And then I'm hoping I will finally write a book, Debbie. Yes, I I hope you do. (laughs) I have been talking about it for probably more than a decade now. And I've been really busy doing a lot of stuff for other people. And I think God is moving me into a season where I get to focus on that a little bit. So that's exciting. I've said it out loud now to your audience. I know, right? (laughs) And I'll tell you, when I wrote my book, it took me, I thought, oh, I'll do this in a year. And then like three years later. Yes. And that is what people say. And so I'm like, okay, when do I have this kind of time? So So. just start, just start. (laughs) It'll, it'll be a while, but that's exciting. That's exciting. Well, where can the audience find you online? Yeah. So I am on Instagram. That's really the only social media. You may see some other profiles out there, but the only place I really engage is on Instagram, which is Shannon S. Scott. And then my website is shannonsuzannescott.com. And so I keep things uh, updated there. I have a sub stack where I'm starting to write um, frequently. And that is also available through my website to subscribe to if you're a sub stack person. Okay, great. Well, I will have all of those links in the show notes, ladies, if you want to reach out or connect with Shannon and follow her online. But Thank yeah. you so much for Debbie, having this conversation with us you. today. Thank you for the way that you're serving all of us who find ourselves in midlife and all that comes with that. Cause it's a lot of no longer like this and not yet like this. And a lot of having kids and parenting our parents. And it, it's, it's something it's a lot of change. Be, it's a lot of change and something that needs to be talked about. So I'm grateful for your voice in this space. Well, thank you. Well, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Well, I hope you found Shannon's story, albeit difficult, as beautiful as I see it. Life is hard sometimes. Our stories are hard. But there is beauty to be found even in the midst of those hard things. And when I hear of God's faithfulness and God's tenderness in other people's lives, it gives me the extra hope I need to keep walking and trusting Jesus even through hard seasons of my own. I will link Shannon's website and Instagram in the show notes, and I'll be sure to let you know when her podcast releases so you can listen to that too. I know she'll have great wisdom to share. Okay, next week on the podcast, I'm having two very special guests who, unbeknownst to them, helped me finally launch my own podcast. So be sure to subscribe and tune in to find out the full story. Also, I know I say it every week, Subscribe and review wherever you listen, but here's why. When you subscribe and give a review, it makes the podcast stand up higher in the ratings so more women can find it when they're searching for midlife encouragement. But even better, if you like the podcast and find it helpful or entertaining, the best thing that you can do to help me spread the word is tell a friend about it and encourage her to listen. So thank you in advance. The best advertising in the world is the recommendation from a girlfriend. Thanks for tuning in today. And remember, midlife is just a brand new season to find your passion and purpose for your grand finale. Talk next week.